Hello, good morning, and welcome to the first lecture in the 2023 to 24 Royal Army's Winter Lecture Series. Uh, I'm Mark Bennett, I'm the museum's research manager. Thank you for joining us today at a slightly unusual time to accommodate our international speaker, but it's well worth it. The Royal Armouries is the UK's national collection of arms and armour. It started as a medieval stockpile of weapons at the Tower of London. In the middle of the 19th century, it shed its practical responsibilities and became a museum. In the mid-1990s, the museum expanded from its historic home at the Tower of London to a new dedicated museum in Leeds and an artillery-focused museum in Portsmouth. All three sites are open to visitors. For more details, go to the website, which is royalarmories.org. But today we're here for the museum's winter lecture series. This is going to run from October till April and will cover topics from the medieval pad arms through the Mauser archives, the 19th century naval cutlass, the Afghan arms industry and the global liberation armies of Cold War Africa. So, Kobe, you mentioned you're interested in both medieval armour and modern firearms. We've covered them both in the next series. If you're interested in future events, sign up to our website to watch them by Zoom or subscribe to our YouTube channel where they'll appear both as the talk take place and the odds video on demand. So again, Kobe, you don't have to be there on time to watch them. You can watch them at your leisure whenever you choose. In fact, you can catch up with the, most of our previous events from the recent summer lecture series back to the start of COVID when we first ventured into streaming on the YouTube channel. After the event, we'll be taking questions from both the Q&A function in Zoom and the YouTube chat, but there's no need to be polite. Send them in as and when they occur to you and I'll put them to the speaker after the talk. I can't guarantee to get through them all. Uh, I can't promise to cover the most popular ones, but we'll get through as many as we can. Uh, you can also add captions if you're hard of hearing. There's a CC button at the bottom of the screen in both Zoom and YouTube. Uh, if you have any technical issues, then in Zoom, you've got the option to raise a hand or ask it through the Q&A function. People on YouTube are probably best off refreshing because Google uh, Alphabet has got it quite down, certainly better than I can to offer technical support. So with all those technical considerations out of the way, let's turn to today's event. Now, the museum does have some small objects which starts from armour, swords and firearms made for children, working down to three copies of the smallest mass production pistol ever made, which fires a bullet with a diameter of 2.7 millimetres or a tenth of an inch. But all these pale in comparison to the weaponization of matter on the atomic or subatomic scale. And to take us through some of the developments in this field, we have Dr. Kobe Leans, among other affiliations, a honor, an honorary senior fellow at the Department of War Studies at KCL. So without any further ado, over to you, Kobe. Thank you so much, Mark and uh, Emily, for facilitating this. And thank you so much for Annette, allowing me to speak. This is a very, very exciting opportunity. As Mark said, I'm really keen for people to ask questions, for this to be more conversational. Uh, we Australians don't stand on uh, pro forma or custom. So, you know, colonial, colonial uh, outpost here, feel free to jump in and ask us any questions. So I'm going to start by sharing, um, just give me a minute, sorry, sharing my screen. Bear with me. Yeah. Not sure. Can everyone see that? Uh, I, I can't at the moment, unfortunately, but I do have your slides if you want me to share them. Can... Yeah, would you mind? That would be fantastic. Go for it. Just give me a second. Thanks very much. It's always great when you give a talk about technology and the technology doesn't work up front. There we go. How's that? Can everyone see that? Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you no very problem. much. So what I'd like to do in this presentation today is not talk at you about law. I'm a, um, a reformed lawyer, I'm a reformed academic, and I currently work in the corporate sector on AI governance. And the, the journey I want to take you on today is really how I got to where I am today and what I was really interested in. Sorry. Yep. Thanks. So the topic of my, my research project was, was actually off the back of having attended a lot of conferences where the conversations would go something like, We've got chemical weapons, we've got biological weapons, we've got nuclear weapons, and then we've got, and then people would sort of mumble nano, quantum, some other unknown sort of sciences. 
And they would never really get into what those were and they'd go, oh, there's not really any law and we don't really know. And I am the kind of person who when someone says we don't really know a thing, that's when I want to know more and want to jump into it. So for better or for worse, I spent six years of my life researching this. A full disclaimer, I'm not actually a science scientist by training. Um, so I spent at least a year getting into the actual nuts and bolts, but for the purposes of listening to this presentation, you don't need to be a lawyer, you don't need to be a technologist, you don't need to be anything really, because I really want to make sure that everyone can understand this presentation. So if there's anything you have questions about, please ask along the way. If you don't mind flicking to the next slide, Mark. So for those of you who, if anyone, I know there's one other Australian in the room, uh, know what these are, you'd be unusual, even for an Australian, most people don't actually know that the largest um, source and the oldest engineering sites or technologies of any human exist in, or in continuous use rather, I should say, exist actually in Australia. This is a very, very old fish trap. And what these fish traps were used for was to capture fish as they were um, caught, put them into pools of different temperatures. And basically it's kind of an old school fridge. The reason I wanted to show this image is that firstly, partially what we're going to talk about today is a lot about what's not seen or less seen or things we don't talk about, both the matter and the law, because we tend to skip over them. And the other is because I am presenting to you from the land of the Wurundjeri people, and this land was never ceded. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that a lot of the Indigenous knowledge that sits here kept this land maintained, rich, fruitful and productive over hundreds and hundreds of years. So I think it's really important just to acknowledge for a moment that I'm talking to you from this land and that this land has shaped a lot of my thinking. Next slide. Thanks. So what was the framing I used for the question I asked? Well, again, by way of context, I was really interested. I was in Geneva when the Article 36 guide was written by the uh, International Committee of the Red Cross. For those who aren't familiar with the Article 36 guide, it's really effectively a weapons review system or a, a, an article that requires countries that acquire or modify weapons, and that's a really important distinction, to think about where those weapons are going to be used. And in the weapons that you were describing before, Mark, whether it's the bullets or the guns or the even the swords, it was pretty easy to go, okay, this kind of weapon is going to do this kind of thing. And for anyone who's worked in the weaponry space, there are actual labs in Switzerland where guns are shot with bullets to test sort of projectile impacts and what they'll be. And there's a lot of detail that's around a lot of the weapons that are sold today, particularly as, you know, sort of a sales package, but I think also in terms of the Article 36 reviews. There are a number of country, countries that do these reviews, not all of them do them, and they do do them in quite different ways, but technically or frequently they sit within legal departments. So again, you'd have some engineers explaining to some lawyers how a weapon would work. And the questions would really be around, you know, what kind of collateral damage could there be? What kind of ways could these potentially um, create outcomes that wouldn't be compliant with other international law or the rest of the Geneva Conventions? The Geneva Conventions really are, for those, again, who aren't familiar, a uh, part of international humanitarian law, or I refer to it as the laws of war because I think it's actually there's a much broader swathe of laws that do apply to this. What we really are looking at, again, is, is how to, or what the laws were invented with the intention of doing was to minimise the harm during war and to create a humanitarian approach after many, many people were just being slaughtered needlessly. So there are these, for some, again, if they're not familiar with laws of war, it's kind of an absurd idea that you can kill people, but you can't kill them in every way and all the ways that you would want to think about. The other point to think about is that this was also a, a review. These reviews require thinking about where the weapons will be used, how they will be used, what kind of environments they'll be used. And an Article 82 actually requires advice on the battlefield or in real time in terms of the context. So you can't just review a weapon and then go, okay, we've reviewed this thing, this system, we think we know how it's going to be used and we are just going to use it in any kind of context. You really need to think about it and you'll see that as I go through the three examples. So in this project, I looked at three different examples. I didn't want to talk about laws that uh, laws applying to things that were science fiction or hypothetical, as exciting as that might have been. What I really wanted to do was have a realistic view of what was being used with nanomaterials, what was where the laws would, would apply and where the gaps were. So instead of crying out for all new law, which again, some of this will be very familiar for those in the tech space now, if you're looking at how tech is governed more generally, it's very easy to say there's no law that applies, but you have to kind of go into the weeds of the technology to understand it, to be able to say, is there or is there not law that applies? Why should I care? Because the impacts of these tools 
not falling under law means that states will develop and potentially use them in ways that don't comply with the laws that exist. And also there's a risk of escalation. Some of these, some of these uh, weapons are, have got pretty strong psychological impacts, and particularly when you're getting to the, the invisible sizes of the weapons that we're going to talk about or the systems that we're going to talk about today. So it was really important to me to think about all of those things, to frame them in a way that would be useful, not just for this particular project, but also for other new technologies, which is what led me to the work that I'm doing today. But that's a long time on one slide, Mark, if you don't mind moving to the next slide. That would be great. Thanks very much. So is there law? Yes, there's law. I don't want to go into all of it. It's quite boring unless you're a lawyer. I mean, apart from the prohibition on blinding laser weapons, all of these weapons came, all the, these prohibitions came into being after the weapons were used, um, which is an interesting one because often we humans are a little bit slow on the uptake, um, not just the lawyers, but humans in general, and these weapons would be used and then people go, hold on, that's probably not really a great idea. For those who are not lawyers, again, there's treaty law, which is black and black letter law where states will agree on a particular way of approaching a problem. And each of these treaties and conventions has really different politics, histories, framings that, that mean interpreting them can be really interesting when you're thinking about new technologies. Well, I find it interesting. Some people just find it incredibly challenging, but I love that, that kind of work. Then you've got what's called customary international law, and that's some of that is now codified, but it came out of the practice of states. So states both saying that they meant to do a thing, but also saying, you know, this is what we're in doing the thing and the state practice creates customary international law. So these, these ideas of, you know, you need to be able to distinguish between combatants and civilians. You need to be, your responses need to be proportional. Again, raise some really nuanced questions around new technologies and particularly technologies you can't even see. I kind of went out on a little bit of a limb here, um, even since, well, since I did my law degree, which is a long time ago now, because I'm obviously uh, been around for a while, a lot of the international law that we think about now as applying and uh, what didn't didn't apply before or wasn't thought of applying before, but increasingly that area of law is changing where people are saying, well, what about the environmental impacts? What about human rights impacts? Even during war, should human rights apply? So again, I tried to look at as broad a swathe of law as possible, which got me thinking about the civilian uses and again, doing doing more of what I'm doing now. But what you want to hear about is the exciting technologies. Everyone wants to know about the exciting technologies. And it was probably also the worst project to research because everybody wanted to hear about it at parties. And for anyone who's done a PhD, the last thing you want to do is talk about your PhD at a party. So if you don't mind going to the next slide, Mark, and I'll, I'll jump into that. Fantastic. So I'm just going to jump in right here. Um, I can explain what nano is to you but it's not really the same as actually having a visual. Uh, I think after COVID, there was a lot more talk of nano and particularly mRNA, so people are more aware. But basically, uh, nano is 10 to the power of nine. It's, it comes from the word uh, linguist vavach, meaning dwarf. And it's basically what an apple is to the size of the earth or 80,000 times across a human hair. Now, I can say all those things, but this visual, I think it's fantastic to just kind of showcase what we're actually talking about. So what's not visible, what's atomic, which Mark has already really lovely uh, framed, framed in a beautiful way, but also it's where a lot of our bodily functions happen. Sorry, I've got a little visitor who wants to be on this co-present, so don't mind me. So if we're talking about what that sort of size is, and I know it's a slightly tongue-in-cheek topic, does size matter? And one of the things that I really want to look at is, you know, what's new and what's different. So nanomaterials as substances have existed for thousands of years. They exist in sea spray and in milk, and they have a lot of a lot of implications. Some people will know of, of sort of nanomaterials being harmful through asbestos. And the reason that they're different from normal materials is that the surface area to the internal ratio is really different. So you have a much larger surface area to a tiny again, beyond human vision kind of perspective. So when you're thinking about using them, the, the impacts of using things with nanomaterials can have a whole different range, a whole different range of impacts that you really need to understand the nanomaterials to, to, to grasp. But a lot of nanomaterials also don't operate that differently. And the areas in which the research, and I'm sure this is, um, is there have been updates to this, I try to follow the literature, but it's now moving incredibly quickly. The, re the areas in which nanomaterials are really having the most impact uh, in the biological space, but also any kind of metallic nanomaterials tend to be toxic. There could be materials that are not toxic at the regular scale, but at the nanoscale they are. And so thinking about what those, what that might look like and what that means in a, in a military context or in an armed 
uh, in armed combatant, combatants using them was something that I also really, really wanted to explore. So getting onto the first, the first of my technologies was thermobarics. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, this image is uh, from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I didn't think that this kind of technology would be relevant or in any way talked about, and it was really looking at a relic of how nanomaterials were used in the past. That is, we really wanted to, I really wanted to explore what, what the impacts were if you were to use nanomaterials and an explosive. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to give someone... I think the sausage that's on this table that he wants, this is not part of my usual presentation. So thermobarics work differently to regular uh, regular types of explosions. For those of you who are familiar with, with um, normal explosives, you've normally got one substance that reacts with another substance and creates some kind of explosion. Thermobarics are a, a nanomaterials, so they're very, very small, built on a very small scale, and they interact with the oxygen in the air, which means they create an inc incredible vacuum, and they're incredibly violent. They were used, which, again, is ironic for any weapon, but these are particularly harsh we weapons. Um, they get up to 2,500 to 3,000 degrees. They shred internal organs, and they're mostly used in um, bunker warfare. So they were basically being used to hunt out people who are hiding in bunkers when I say hunt out I mean cause immense harm but their physical impacts reading about the physical impacts is in, incredibly hard to read what the nanomaterial version of a thermo and this these exist in a regular scale as well when you use nanomaterials what they do is they become um, it increases the size of the explosion it increases the heat of the explosion and ultimately the lethality of the explosion so the question around uh, the thermobaric weapons was really if we're adding nanomaterials to this particular weapon system, which has been done now, what does that mean for international law? And in this presentation, I'm not going to bore you with all of the law. Needless to say, a lot of the law still, still applies. But thinking about that in terms of, okay, you've got a weapon that's the same weapon as before but more intense and in some ways is actually comparable to potentially some small nuclear uh, explosions without the residuals, and sometimes with the residuals, this is the other rabbit hole I went down, what kind of nanomaterials are left? Given that we know that some nanomaterials can be toxic, what does that mean longer term? And in this particular area, one of the gaps is what is the environmental impact of using weapons where there's residuals that might have long-term impacts on water tables, on, um, on food supply chains that gets into food supply chains. And the other thing about nanomaterials is they cross the blood-brain barrier. So once they're in your body, you can't really get them out. Um, really interesting questions around thermobarics and again really sad to see that they're actually being used now not just in enclosed caves but against the civilian population in Ukraine which is um yes not not compliant with international law I think it's fair to say so the next next slide please so the next the next technology sounds really sci-fi um and again has advanced enormously it's a little bit like um CRISPR has nine genetic modification. Scientists love to write papers about this. The idea was basically looking at research, looking at lasers, which are at nanoscale, to control uh, mind behaviors. And there are other ways that are actually easier to do this than, than optogenetics. But I looked at optogenetics specifically because, again, I wanted to choose technologies that were relevant, that were being used, that actually posed some kind of risk. So imagine instead of this being a a cute little white rat that it's actually a human. Imagine that you don't necessarily have to have it attached. The idea is that you have opsins in the brain, and again, at the, the cellular level. And by switching those opsins on and off, you can actually change memories, in, increase fear, reduce fear, um, many, many applications, both for defence but also potentially for a, a population that you are trying to control. A little bit sci-fi in terms of the applications, but a real technology nonetheless, and one that's had some pretty profound applications in terms of the, the health the health aspects. So you can see that nanomaterials being used in this way would raise completely different issues from the thermobaric weapon that I was showing before. So we're talking about a lot of neurological control, which, I mean, there's a lot of talk now about um, different kinds of neurological inventions. And there's a, an amazing Australian, actually, who's, who's invented a stent that can be put into, um, into humans without surgery that can have a similar effect in terms of changing behaviors but can also activate limbs and do some really good stuff i'm always looking at you know what's the what's the way this could be misused it's so much more fun to talk about the harms and the risks and legally what are the limits what can you do what does it mean from a human rights perspective if you can change memory if you can make someone more aggressive what does that mean for liability 
it, it raises many questions that I couldn't answer in this book because, again, these projects are fairly limited in their scope, but it really was interesting to think about what kind of law applies. And, again, a lot of law does apply because you really can't be using systems against um, civilians or combatants without consent in this kind of way. So I think there's a new area that's evolving, not just in relation to optogenetics, but in terms of brain um, and memory management more generally. Um, next slide, please. So I didn't look at genetically modified cats, as, as interesting as that would have been. This is an actual project where um, a gene was altered in cats. But what I was really interested in looking at, again, because nanomaterials are operational at the biological level, if you were to modify genes, what would that mean? And many of you would have heard of CRISPR-Cas9. Again, it's an incredible popular, incredibly popular topic of science that's had a lot of papers written. But this idea... Again, it's not new. There's been a lot of modification of genes in the past. The difference with CRISPR-Cas9 was the speed and the ease with which genes could be modified. So this idea that you could intervene in someone's biology, not just for them, but also for their, for their germline. So their children would then be affected. And also thinking about it in more interesting ways, how these kinds of interventions could potentially be partnered with with other kinds of approaches. So if you were to genetically modify your population to be immune to a particular thing, but not, not the other another population, what would that mean? How could you create um, creative and horrible ways to harm people, basically? So again, this, this area really looked at a very different area of law. Again, it's slightly similar to optogenetics in some ways, but raise different issues because it's not just neurological, it's also physiological. So what, what does law say? I mean, at the time that Geneva Conventions were written and Article 36 reviews were considered, nobody ever thought about genetic modification or what could possibly be done. And so all of these questions were surfaced through this really deep interrogation of what technologies were, how they were being used, and, again, some papers actually being written about how defence was considering it. Um, using these technologies that already existed in the civilian sphere. So if you don't mind going to the last slide. The, I really want to leave a lot of time for questions because I'm not sure about what the audience is going to be interested in, but the main thing that I really wanted to raise in this and the main conclusions that I came to were, or the recommendations that I made, were fairly concrete. They were Article 36 reviews are no longer fit for purpose. They still need to be used, but it's not enough to just have a lawyer and an engineer in the room. You really need to think about who is make, doing these reviews. So you need to have an interdisciplinary team of people who are able to interrogate and question what the impact of these systems might be because they're complex, particularly when you're looking at the biological ones and thinking more in terms of there's a particular clause called the Martin's Clause. Like, are these things things that we want to be doing? They, the Martin's Clause talks about being against the dictates of public conscience. Sometimes the higher level principles can actually be more powerful than the, the technical laws that sometimes don't, don't hit the mark. The other thing about the Article 36 reviews was the timing. If you make a gun and a bullet, it's really, really easy to say, this is when we need to review it. This is when it's been sold. This is when it's been used. This is when it's been modified. With a lot of this work, a lot of it's done by scientists who perhaps might have defence funding at universities, who perhaps might not even be thinking about the applications. And a good example of this was someone at a conference I saw who was looking at enzyme inhibitors also um, so to stop certain bodily functions, which is at the nanomaterial, the nanoscale rather. And when I asked him, you know, why this might be used by defence who was funding his research, he sort of went, oh, I haven't really thought about it. It doesn't really matter. I'm getting money for my research, which a lot of us who've done academic work will understand. We need that sort of financial input. But again, how do you get the right people to ask the right questions who are independent because so many of people with this expertise are already going to be funded by defence? They're already going to have vested interests. And then from a policy perspective, I think thinking a lot more carefully about some of the risks of these technologies. And again, this is sort of outside of the scope of this project, but thinking about the implications of, you know, aerosol, aerosolization of certain materials or other ways in which these materials, you know, on the face of it can be really helpful, but can also be incredibly harmful. They're really questions we need to be asking a lot more and to be setting up systems where we can ask those questions. The third thing and oh, the final recommendation is, really also to think about within those communities, if you are working in these kinds of scientific areas, 
a little bit like those who've seen Oppenheimer, when do you say we know we can, but we're not really sure if we should? I still don't think we have the right platforms for those kinds of conversations. And I would really like to see a lot more of them. Um, I'm very happy to open up now, Mark, if there are some questions or if anyone wants to sort of jump on, I can go down a number of different directions on this topic. But um, that's a very, very quick run through of, of this, this a broader project overall. Because I've, I've certainly got tons. Thank you for that. So, yes, if you have any questions, please do drop them in the chat in YouTube and the Q&A in Zoom. If you're having issues with the sides, we apologise. So there's, we know there's an issue where you only see the top right hand corner. We're not quite sure what causes it. We haven't been able to replicate it. Uh, sometimes switching to Zoom uh, to YouTube works. They will all be up there when the video is over, so you can uh, you can see those if if you're really interested in, for instance, that display of the the, the nano scale, which is fascinating. But <clears throat> yeah, I, I I have a few certainly because these these technologies incredible. Like I, I'm shocked and amazed every time I, I've, I've read a little bit into it, but it's just it, it's mind blowing that what's being done. Uh, at the moment. I was going to ask that we've seen a lot about AI. Is this as immediate, significant a threat as AI has been widely discussed, or is this perhaps longer term? Well, there's an assumption in that question that AI is an immediate uh, mm -hmm. life uh, existing threat, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I've thought and written about. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I think there are two things I always ask. What is new? Yep. and what exists already, and they're two separate questions. Mm -hmm. what, what is different about this moment? So AI has been around since 1956, the Dartmouth Conference, where a bunch of people got together, you know, for eight weeks when mm -hmm. academics had enough money to have eight-week conferences, can you imagine, with all the <laughs> catering and all the time? And, and it needs a disciplinary conference where a bunch of people came together and really imagined something that would change the world when artificial was still really positive. So this is when people liked lino and, you know, plastic cups, right? We're in a different era now, but this idea of artificial was great. Over time, obviously, these systems have advanced, but um, I was in a conference recently where someone said, oh, who was thinking about this before ChatGPT? And I was like, I wrote a paper on ChatGPT too. Like there were people who were thinking about these things and talking about these things. So I think that the short answer to your question is all of these technologies have risks, and this is sort of the framing of my book as well, they also all have benefits. It's mm -hmm. about where we put the guardrails and how what we accept and tolerate. And sometimes really technical regulation is the answer and sometimes mm -hmm. broader high-level principles are the answer. Either way, I don't think we should be hysterical. It's not mm -hmm. the end of the world, nor mm -hmm. is it, you know, the solution to everything. Mm -hmm. We need to sort of approach these tools as, as they are. I was going to say, the, the, the lack of scrutiny at the moment, is that, international law the international community being slow to catch up with things or does it benefit people at the moment to have this this lack of scrutiny around ai or around nano uh, primarily around nanotechnology although i guess the, the same remarks sort yeah. of apply to both yeah i think i think in the nano space um so andrew maynard and uh, many others have written about this the regulation has followed so you know initially it was sort of the wild west and everything was going everything was possible but i don't think that's the case anymore i think with AI, there's a different story going on. I think there's really a push to not have certain conversations. Um, mm -hmm. I've written some articles about social silences, mm -hmm. to quote Pierre Bordeaux, where there's just where there are just things we just don't talk about. And again, that narrative that it's it's urgent, it's brand new, it'll change the world. It's you know we've also got a climate crisis going on right now. I'm not sure that that anything is more pressing than that. And it's very mm -hmm. easy to be distracted mm -hmm. by the long termers who you yeah. know focus on the the kind of crazy you mm -hmm. know. We'll be all fine. The wealthy people will go elsewhere, and they'll go off. To, you know, we'll go off to another planet. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important to keep these things in perspective. Um, so in in, the in context of AI, and I'm not alone in saying this, there's a there's been a pushback against regulation, and now they know that it's coming and the wave's coming. It's let's get on it and be part of it. Both mm -hmm. of those have issues. There is no law, and there's all the law is are both problematic. Again, those sort of mm -hmm. diametrically opposed views are not correct. We have two questions from, and I apologise if I pronounce it incorrectly, but do spend on YouTube. So the first one is about dragon skin armour. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. I'm not. Oh, familiar. the invisible skins. Yes, ah, yes, perfect. I am. Yeah. So I think that's what you're talking about. I mean, feel free to clarify. But I was um, going to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Please. Yeah. So there was, there was someone else who'd done a little bit of research on this before I started, and it was very, very alluring. I thought oh, I can write about invisible ability cloaks. I mean, that's mm -hmm. really what we all want to talk about, right? No one wants to talk about the other weapons. Um, they're not uh, impossible to make. They're just you, 
you've got to imagine the size of the material that you're making. The trouble is that graphene and creating nanomaterials is incredibly expensive and time and energy intensive. So making a cloak on that scale, unfortunately, um, for better or for worse, is, is not really possible at this stage, but that's not to say that the technology won't advance to a, to a point that it can. On a smaller scale, yes, um, these, these sorts of... Uh, bending, light bending, particularly um, having these particular properties is possible. So if you have a very, very small, a nanoscale dragon, yes, you could potentially do it. Mm -hmm. Great. So, yeah, so, I mean, obviously clarify if that's not exactly what you were looking for. But the other <laughs> question that you had was, uh, is it possible to use optogenetics through the optical nerve, uh, hypothetically or, or otherwise, which I presume is seeing through someone's eyes? But again, you might want to, to clarify that if uh, do spend. Yeah, so again, full disclosure, not, not a medical expert. Opsins, as I understand it, uh, I don't know if they're in the eye. I know that they're in the brain. So in the, they're in our neurons and that's the function. But as far as I know, they're not, but I might be wrong. Mm -hmm. the, the question I had on that, and I don't, I, I, I'm not, I don't know if anyone's thought about this, but if you can change people's memories, surely that's got massive implications for the legal system of how we how we accept witness testimony but I, I don't know if that's something that's huge at the moment. no i think people are starting to talk about neurotechnologies more broadly there are a couple of um a couple of academics who've sort of made it their, their mission and not just optogenetics so again i've looked at one particular angle but the ability to understand the human brain brain is advancing so rapidly and again part of this came out of i had very um a small amount of seed funding at the beginning of this project where i attended a conference um the emerging technologies conference in arizona which is amazing mm -hmm. um it's, it was also the the conference that made me get off facebook because i found out what facebook was doing and how they were tracking me so that was years ago and i haven't been there since but this idea that um you could somehow track in someone's brain they actually showed someone watching a movie and then they showed mm -hmm. what they could extract from the brain in terms of the patterns they were seeing and i know now those images are far clearer so there's the what you put in and what you can change and particularly mm -hmm. in terms of memories horrifying black mirror mm -hmm. episodes have been made about it mm -hmm. but there's also about what you can, there's this this question of what you can get out so you know i don't really want anyone to be able to see what I, i'm a very visual person i don't really want people to be seeing what's going mm -hmm. on in my brain i think there are really interesting questions around that i don't think they're going to be mainstream technologies but i do think they can be used in conjunction and again these technologies can also be used at the same time there's not they're not one standalone technology mm -hmm. really interesting questions for the legal system absolutely yeah i think that may, that may possibly ask, uh, answer part of dispense additional question which is how in-depth and modular is it currently because we had another question from, uh, let me just check, it's from Clab on YouTube. So they asked, if you can affect people's moods, couldn't you in theory make everyone depressed? The one that worried me more is, could you in theory make everyone happy? Because that might be terrible. Yeah, I don't know. I think the depression is kind of happening with the tech anyway. Like there were mm. some really interesting articles this week in The Guardian about addiction and children in Australia, particularly gambling. Mm -hmm. um, that's a whole other, again, it's much easier to kind of do that if anyone stands at the, the tube there or the, the train here or anywhere, everyone's on their phones all the time, right? Like the addicting the addiction models that they're using are working. So I think there are easier ways to make people sad. But I think to your point, yeah, it's more worrying if you can actually make people complacent or mm. uh, unable to connect with other people around them. But again, I mean, at the risk of sounding really flippant or facetious, I think a lot of that is happening with the devices that we're holding in front of us all the time anyway. You know, we have an mm -hmm. epidemic of loneliness at the time that we're more more than connected than ever, more connected than ever. So there are easier ways to do this and intervening in the human brain or changing the human biology. Um, those may be options further down the track for certain applications. But I think Technology as a whole is doing that. Even though we talk about using this, these devices for wellness or the industry talks about it a lot, there are a lot of other implications. We're just starting to understand some really interesting research on that point around um, kids and algorithms and eating disorders with girls and violence with boys. I just don't think we're talking about or understand enough how mm -hmm. these systems are actually nudging and changing behaviours in our society, including voting for populist governments across Europe. Mm -hmm. yeah. On that note, so... What's the most practical approach here? Is it banning entire fields of study or are they, uh, is it for every one of these inventions, even down to the sort of very, very granular modular ones, are there potential benefits that we could, you know, are the potential benefits from pursuing those avenues too great to, to say for any particular field or subfield that we said do nothing in this area? Um, astonishingly, I don't have all of the answers <laughs> to the greatest of our world's problems, but I think a little bit, again, like Oppenheimer, for those who haven't seen it, 
Um, one of Einstein's last acts before he died was to set up a working group called Pugwash, which mm-hmm. sits beside the UN meetings and still takes place now. And I have the privilege of attending a number of those where scientists came together, not as their country representatives, but just as scientists to say, mm-hmm. is this what we should be doing? Like, is this really where we want to be going with our research? So I'm certainly not one to say let's ban everything, but I think we're missing out on some of those conversations around, and this goes for nano as much as it goes for AI right now. Mm -hmm. What kind of society do we want? What happens when the jobs are automated and we don't have taxes and we can't fix hospitals or build roads? Like what, what, what does the world look like? So thinking longer term about the impacts of these technologies and what their direct impacts are, but also how these tools are shaping us. I think, Mm -hmm. you know, with the nano weapons that are biological there's something at least for me that's it's quite abhorrent that someone could change not just my genetics but the genetics of my children mm-hmm. uh, there are just places where we shouldn't go and that's where these these principles of you know there's just there are just things we shouldn't do but they differ across cultures and that's where international negotiation and conversations which are very hard to have these days still need to be taking place both in the scientific communities but also in the international communities in a more meaningful way Although it's it's concerning that the I was thinking of your enzymes example because yeah. as you know as a museum we have a research ethics policy even though our what we do is you know doesn't have many immediate implications you know we're, we're in a lot of cases we're more concerned about harming the objects than we are necessarily people because we've got safety procedures but it's it's <laughs> fascinating that even the universities are not necessarily quite as uh, attuned to these sort of implications because I would have thought that they they would force them to look into the implications. It's an interesting one. I mean, having worked with and alongside data scientists and engineers in two different university faculties, I think there's a lot of the, if we can, we just should. Mm -hmm. And creating that culture of, even in the ethics, again, also having sat on ethics boards at universities, um, (laughs) it takes having a diversity of thought and an ability to question a challenging culture to say, oh, have you thought about how this could be misused and it's not a popular thing if you're talking about a project that's getting a lot of funding to say "Mm, is that really and and we've been there right anyone who's been in academia it's very hard to say no to large sums of money when you want to be pursuing knowledge and to turn a blind eye to what those implications might be I think is is very very easy which raises bigger systemic questions around funding of universities and independence of research that that I think are probably too big for me to grapple with on this presentation, given that my topic is on the small things. But yeah. I was gonna, just for, for perspective, university ethics committees, do, do they tend to involve lay people or is it primarily university membership? Almost always university membership and not even diverse. I mean, again, universities don't have a particularly diverse cohort mm. to begin with. They're kind of mm. self-selecting. Um, but no, not lay people and and also not aware. I mean, one of the things that I think about or write a lot about now is the data aspect. They're really not concerned. There was one project, one of the, univers- one of the universities I worked at, where they were taking voice samples from children to identify COVID, to mm-hmm. diagnose COVID. And the research project held that data indefinitely and then was reused for other research projects and everybody else seemed to be fine with that. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are a lot of blind spots in academic communities and there are a lot of, there's not really enough knowledge about how to securely keep data and what that kind of biometric data means when you can't change it later or, you know, if it could be connected with other data sets. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that university ethics are where they need to be, but that's a whole other topic. (laughs) Dragging us back to, to yeah, I, I mean, obviously fast, fascinating for me, but dragging it back to the nanotechnology stuff, I was, I was curious, we, we talked about, certainly in the context of dragon skin, the, the difficulties of uh, manufacturing, but again, rough, rough finger in the air, how far away are we from the point where these kind of, you know, more advanced nanotechnology uh, developments are not as, you know, a, a kind of available at the corporate level, perhaps even the, the individual level? A more mainstream. It's a really good question. Uh, and again, I don't I don't know at what point they become commercially viable. I know that there are medicines that are now being developed that can target specific, I mean, cancer is a great example, right? So you can actually have little nanobots that kind of swim through um, 
there's an article I wrote with a colleague years ago called Neither Bot Nor Beast, this idea of basically creating organisms that can kind of shuttle through your body to go to where they need to go. That's already happening. Mm -hmm. And I think for medicines, there's there's a greater need. But as much as I would love the dragon skin on my tiny dragon, uh, I don't know that that's going to be commercially viable at any point in the near future. Mm -hmm. Um, There are probably, again, it's always there are cheaper and easier ways to make objects invisible, although obviously nowhere near as cool as the dragon skin. So Mm -hmm. I understand the interest in it. Um, but commercially viable, no. I just think the the scale of production, the cost of production. But to your point, I, I mean, the short answer is I don't know. I don't. <laughs> it comes down to commercial viability and demand. Maybe if mm-hmm. someone has a Kickstarter idea and there's enough funding, mm-hmm. who knows? It's possible. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, no, the things things always move either glacially slower or dramatically quicker than you would anticipate when it comes to, to technology. Yeah, it's, it's hence my skepticism about futurists. I don't know what the future is going to bring. I can just look at all of the way that things have developed so far. You know, history doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes. So mm-hmm. it's good to look at the past to understand the future. And a, a, a nice one from Jack Yates on YouTube to, to close us off, I think. What's the scary, because again, we're, we're at the point where we're, we're all going to be closing our laptops. What's the scariest thing that's come up in your research that made you close your laptop and say, that's enough research for today? Time, time to spend time with the dogs Oof. and the family. That's such a good question. I don't know that there's any individual piece of research, mm-hmm. but I have to also say that I've been working on, years ago I started working on chemical and biological weapons control, mm-hmm. so I've sort of got an immunity to that kind of thing. I have yeah. a weird ability to deal with any kind of, mass destruction Mm -hmm. system what i can't deal with are the stories about individuals Mm -hmm. i can talk about genocide but i can't talk about domestic violence like there's sort of this personal distancing of from the science that means that and i think that's partially why i've done this kind of project that i can think about whole systems Mm -hmm. but when i think about how individuals treat each other or Mm -hmm. um you know particular impacts on people i really struggle Mm -hmm. with that so there's no again it sort of goes to that point that there's no single technology in the first opening of my book i talk about the oldest human remains are actually found next to a pile of stones and in those Mm -hmm. human remains the guy's got no teeth Mm -hmm. so you know we're all human in some ways we protect our loved ones Mm -hmm. but we also want to be able to defend our patch Mm -hmm. right so there's this tension inherent in all of the technologies which sort of goes to your point of should we just not do things Mm -hmm. probably with nuclear weapons but you know that's out of the bag the world Mm -hmm. would be a very different place if we didn't but there's this thing about human curiosity that just drives, particularly scientists, that just the mm-hmm. can we is, is such a powerful driving factor mm-hmm. that it's very, very hard to, to <coughs> stop. Excuse me. True. Although it is how we are able to have these sort of conversations across continents, which is, you know, frustrating, but I guess. It's, be- it's better than a 25-hour plane ride. I'm quite grateful. Yes. Yeah, that's fantastic. <laughs> so thank you very much, Kobe. I was going to say, this has been a sort of a, a fantastic taster. If people are interested in finding out more, what, what would you recommend? Set up a website because I got so many questions and I the, the emails I kept sending people of recommended reads got longer and longer. But um, in the t- tech space, I mean, obviously read my book because it's amazing. No, not really. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's a textbook. Um, in the AI space, there are some amazing books. Uh, Weapons of Math Destruction by Cathy O'Neill is incredible. Atlas of an AI by a fellow Australian, Kate Crawford, is amazing. But the list of books just keeps getting longer and longer on this topic, depending on what you're interested in, whether it's the probability aspect of what we tolerate. Um, there's a whole culture around uh, risk and tolerance, which I've spent a lot of time going down rabbit holes on. If you're interested in the sort of racial bias implications of these kinds of things, um, yeah, lots and lots of different different resources. So, yeah, kobylines.com has a ton of recommended reads if you're interested in exploring any aspects of these topics. I was going to say, and contact details in case people, so if, if we've got any questions that people haven't fielded here but they're curious, are you on social media? I, know you, I believe you, you've... I'm not on Facebook, it. but and, and I left the, uh, the uh, formerly known as X platform as it <laughs> changed hands. I have this need to leave things as they turn evil. Um, you can contact me through my website. There's actually a... a a platform there i do a lot of talks and give a lot of presentations so there's also there's some recordings there uh mm-hmm. as well if people are interested in a more technical or more legal angle on this project mm-hmm. no, fantastic thank you very much and thank you to emily behind the scenes for taking care of the feed to youtube and thank you to the audience for taking time to join us today it's slightly unusual time but definitely worth it 
So our next event isn't for a little while, but on the 25th of October, Professor Jocelyn Alexander of Oxford University is going to look at the global liberation armies of Cold War Africa. And on the 8th of November, we have a bumper session to explore the medieval form of tournament known as the Pad Arms. We'll be joined by Professor Rosalind Brown Grant, Mario Damon and Ralph Moffat of Glasgow uh, Museums. So for more details of future events, those and other ones included, check our website, which is royalarmies.org. Follow us on the social media of your choice, which we still haven't quit. And follow us on Eventbrite if you want direct notification of these events as we post them. But in the meantime, thank you again for joining us today. And I look forward to seeing you later this month. So I will share my uh, share my leaving slides and then we can close cameras and microphones and let people get off. So thank you again, Kobe. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks to everyone for attending at an unusual time in the morning with a, a pitch of being the first one of the season. A lot of pressure. Hope it delivered. I was going to say thank, thank you for braving the time difference as well. It's punishing, but I will, I will let you get off. Absolutely my pleasure. Thank you so much.